So up next, we have Nicholas, join me on stage, um, from Twitter, who's going to talk a bit about um, adaptive systems and UI components, yeah. et cetera. Um, you need to right. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about uh, what I understand of uh, complex adaptive systems or uh, complexity theory <clears throat> and how um, I'm trying to use some of that to apply it to my role as, like a, as an engineer at Twitter where I work on the UI frameworks team. And then how, like on the end I'll get towards how, um, how I think like UI components are part of um, a strategic reaction to uh, like the realities of scaling, like some of our like web products, in particular, like what's going on at Twitter. <clears throat> so first, I'm going to start with like a little bit of an overview of um, complex adaptive systems or complexity theory, um, how like complexity scientists see adaptation as a requirement of um, uh, to have like an adaptive system that is uh, sustainable. Uh, a case study into like how uh, public health. Uh, researchers like found vulnerabilities in their systems and the way that they understood expert strategies to deal with the vulnerabilities in their system. Uh, one of the key takeaways that they brought up, which was this idea of enhancing expertise within complex systems that involve human beings and uh, web components and how uh, they're part of all of that. <clears throat> so complex adaptive systems have, uh, are considered to have three characteristics. Those characteristics are like a series of autonomous agents. So that could be like individual actors who uh, follow a series of rules and make decisions about their local environment. And all of these actors are like operating it simultaneously. So there isn't this kind of like waiting for someone else. No one really knows about what's going on beyond the bounds of, um, of what they're responsible for. Then this idea of a network structure, which is the like framework that binds these actors together and kind of provides the foundation for there to be a system in the first place. So those might be, uh, for, like, for example, in our companies, they'd be like company culture, etiquette around how you talk to each other, rules of operation, uh, some guiding principles that affect the way that you make judgments in your local context. <clears throat> and then the third part is variation. So like intrinsic to adaptive systems is this idea of um, experimentation, innovation, like novel outcomes that you can't predict ahead of time. And a good example of this is uh, flock of birds where you have individual birds but once they're part of a flock they by modeling them as following a few simple rules which is uh, to keep up with the rest of the flock to not bump into anything and to maintain a certain distance from their closest neighbor then in simulations we can like reproduce some of the behaviors of flocks these kind of like complex emergent patterns that come about from uh, autonomous actors following a few simple rules <clears throat> and human beings and the collectives that we're part of and by collective I mean combination of humans and non-humans in the way that we work together to do things like major engineering challenges, whether that's like building a bridge or building these web products, uh, they're adaptive systems as well, complex adaptive systems. And so for example, in the companies that we're all, that most of us are part of anyway, you're part of a complex adaptive system that is part of larger complex adaptive systems and that contains uh, smaller complex adaptive systems as well. <coughs> so the principle behind like what they've, uh, like what complexity scientists uh, have like tried, to, how they've tried to understand all of these like complex phenomena is this idea of nonlinear dynamics and the concept of uh, dynamic equilibrium, which they sometimes also call the edge of chaos. So like nonlinear linear dynamics means that the uh, common assumptions that you might have about cause and effect, the ability to predict the outcomes of something based on an initial input, uh, those don't really work with complex adaptive systems because of this like emergent complexity that comes about without, for, with, even with prior knowledge of as much as you think you, you can gather. And then the dynamic equilibrium is this point that is neither complete stability, which is like stagnation and the inability to adapt to changing environment, um, and then neither, and neither chaos, where there is nothing to bind individual actors together and there's no system to speak of. And the sweet spot is this like dyna dynamic equilibrium where 
Uh, everything is like loosely bound, and there's a lot of like novelty and change, but it, pr it provides the ability to adapt to uh, circumstances. <clears throat> and so this kind of challenge is like some of the uh, some of the things that we like to hold dear, this idea that we can control situations or that going with the flow is somehow passive. Uh, but going with the flow as seems to be like a requirement from the way that they're trying to understand these systems is no more passive or active than a bird riding the thermals into the upper atmosphere. So it's not uh, simply just sitting there allowing anything to happen to it. It's not to deny intent or the role of intent in shaping outcomes but it's to also work in harmony with the realities of the system that you're part of rather than seeing them as something to control. So it's this idea of giving up rigid control and instead working in partnership with these inherent characteristics of systems. <clears throat> and so part of being like uh, a system that is on this edge of chaos is uh, that when you're inside it, you have to accept that it's going to be imperfect and impermanent. And that doesn't mean to accept in like a begrudging way, which is like, oh, you know, well, if only we could have control over it. It's instead to accept it as like a defining characteristic where all of its strength and power comes from this imperfection, this impermanence, and the role of uh, like intent, but without control. So for a system to be sustainable, it has to be able to adapt to these changing circumstances. And those conditions, like the, the sets of circumstances that create uh, change that you need to adapt to can come from both within and without. So that might be uh, changes in expectations that people have of you. So when we're building web products, uh, people will expect certain things from your products based off what they're experiencing elsewhere or changes um, in like other aspects of the world that isn't just changes in how your competitors are building things. And so being in partnership with the reality of that in requires like to be constantly like adapting uh, otherwise, your system basically collapses. And so this, this like, concept of like, impermanence and adaptability is uh, a feature of the system that you have to like, bake into your operating assumptions in order to try and get the most out of it. <coughs> uh, so Doug Bowman used to be our creative director, and he kind of synthesized it in this tweet, which is this idea uh, that I'm going to roll with, which is that um, you know, as, experience, as the expectations of your users changes, as they expect your application to be faster, as they expect it to interfere less or more with their lives, um, you have to be constantly like, keeping up with that. And any uh, assumption that any uh, given point in time you've like, solved that problem or that you're fast enough or that you've done what is required at a given point in time um, is bound to lead to a future point in time where your system is beginning to creak and fall apart. And so instead, you have to uh, be prepared to constantly be changing. <clears throat> and this is something that um, Kim Robinson, who's a science fiction novelist and like, political novelist, um, he kind of summed it up with this, um, which I'm taking. Uh, well, he was talking about it in terms of the socioeconomic system that we're part of, like our global system. But it's kind of true for any system, which is this appreciation that it was built for a purpose and that um, it needs to be constantly changed, and that is like a characteristic of any of these systems that we're building, that you should never be trying to build something that's perfect. And that's because uh, the ability to adapt in time is like business critical, so making sure that your system is designed to be uh, changeable as opposed to solving one problem in an extremely rigid way, which makes it difficult to, to solve like the next problems that come along. Uh, this is like one of the things to be wary of. So about the system vulnerabilities, um, this is a uh, case study that I'm going to talk about that um, Richard Cook described in an article called A Tale of Two Stories. And he's a health professional, and with some of his colleagues, he um, looked at technicians who were involved in blood transfusions and trying to understand. It wasn't that, they were in, that there was a critical failure that was going on in the uh, process of blood transfusions, but they wanted to understand how to improve technician training. And so in the process of researching how it was that they go about uh, like doing things, what their system is, what the vulnerabilities are, they like realized that people or like expertise was deeply involved in uh, coming up with strategies for coping with the uh, vulnerabilities that people had seen in their own systems. So one example was um, of, a, of a point where the system was failing was they were using paper tools and they would read across lines and these long lines of paper, they would accidentally skip up or down a row and make a wrong call on, on the blood transfusion. And so they're wondering, like, why does this not result in you know, patients dying from incorrect blood transfusion, you know, the wrong like, blood with the wrong antigens for their bodies? Um, and they found that the experts had put together like, many strategies for 
catching what they've called like incipient failure. So before it becomes an overt failure and a catastrophic one, like someone dying, they would have all these strategies to catch failures where they knew that failures were, were, were possible in the system that they had. <clears throat> and so what they realized was that there was a, a potential for technology to help transform the way that they operated or that um, even the way that they were already operating was bound by the technological choices they'd made. You know, for example, this sheet of paper. And when they were, they said they had some strategies like reproducing them with technology and trying to help guide people. Um, and they built like systems that would prompt users, uh, prompt technicians to about potential problems that they'd made, because they found that rather than trying to tell them what to do, that providing a computer to help support their expertise was uh, was the key and would help train people up faster. And I think like for us at Twitter, like one of the analogies to that is um, the way that we segment our like user interface code, which has traditionally been the way that most people do it, which is to split up by technology type. Um, and so no matter how skilled a technician you are, when you come in with the systems like foundational principles are that you split the UI up on technology type as opposed to you know, the way that we talk about the UI to each other as these like functional units, you know, like tweet boxes and buttons. So people would have to try and decompose these into these technology types. And then you know, once the essence of a functional unit is you know, decomposed into these, these technology types, then trying to uh, keep any kind of order in terms of who uses what is very difficult. And so you tend to end up with um, a lot of um, like leaking of that functional unit where like, m things that seem different uh, conceptually or that are different in the design like have uh, shared foundations, which can be really problematic. And so the concept that they came up with in this like public healthcare initiative was uh, the idea of like enhancing expertise. <clears throat> so the, an example I'm going to use to like illustrate uh, something that I think was quite a clever use of that was um, uh, Mark Brunel, who is is in, is in uh, well Brunel's father. Uh, he came up with this idea of the tunneling shield. Um, so initially, when they were, this was, at the time that he invented it, the way that you would build a tunnel would be to excavate a big trench in the ground lay a railroad track in it, and then cover it up. And when they wanted to build tunnels under the Thames, um, obviously it wasn't feasible for them to just like block up the Thames, dig out a trench, and stick a tunnel in it for many years. Um, and he realized that the key problem with uh, tunnel building was that you couldn't support the structure of, or the structure that you were digging out, the earth, as you were going you know, underneath a, a riverbed where the soil was very <coughs> soft. So he invented this thing called the tunneling shield that provides structure as you excavated the wall. And this shield had uh, cells in it where individual men would like stand in there, or children as it turned out, would stand in there and like chip away at the wall. And then once the entire, uh, once everyone in this tunneling shield had excavated like four inches, it would be shifted forward and that would leave a space behind where these bricklayers would lay down the bricks and you'd get a reinforced tunnel as you went through. And so he wasn't like replacing the expertise of tunnelers with some kind of modern contraption like a machine that would replace humanity. Instead, he was deploying the existing skill of the labor force and their knowledge about excavation and moving soil out and what to do with it. But he was providing them with um, a system that would allow them to deploy that expertise in the process of building tunnels under the Thames. And now every single like excavation machine, all the modern ones that are circular and automated are still based on this, like, this design principle. So for us as well, that's about not uh, this idea of like automation as a supporting mechanism for engineers rather than uh, automation to replace um, their decision making and their expertise. And so this idea of like how do you enhance expertise? Uh, how did they go about trying to find ways to enhance expertise in the public health care systems that they saw had vulnerabilities? Um, and the way that they, they realized straight away was that yes, you can use tools, you can use technology to help transform things, but first you have to understand um, like what are hard problems? Uh, how do experts go about dealing with the situations that come about in these systems? Like what are the uh, strategies that they already deploy? And so rather than, um, rather than trying to replace people, it's instead of building like a series of like low level uh, rules and guiding principles to kind of guide this messy system in a direction, the intent that you have without necessarily assuming that the outcome is going to be exactly what you want. But the aim is to facilitate this, this adaptation that the system has to go through. And so if we're engineers and you know, part of what we're doing is to take like, product ideas and work with designers and then end up with things that we put in someone's hand and they enjoy the experience, 
then like one of our key roles is not just to talk about technology for its own sake, but to understand like our role in this larger system and how the decisions that we make can affect the ability of others to um, kind of deliver deliver the intent that they have or deliver like outcomes that we want to people. Um, and I think that talking about components and going back to this idea of like the, the structure that we have traditionally used of uh, segmenting the UI based on technology type. Whereas if instead we segment the UI like functionally, for example, like if I explode a, um, a radio clock, <clears throat> you'll see that it's all like functional units as like transistors and wires. I imagine if you took apart a radio clock and it fell apart into like bins of plastic labeled plastic for transistors and like metal for speakers and plastic, you know, miscellaneous plastic. And then you had to try and rebuild a radio from those constituent parts. Very, very difficult, right? But instead you can rely on the fact that each of these autonomous pieces, each of these functional units has been built maybe by thousands of different teams. You know, I doubt that this radio uses transistors built in the same factory as the wiring that it uses or the speakers. But together with expectations about how to use them, about the role, you know, the role that a transistor plays, the expectations that it has about how it gets used, the way that you hook things up to a speaker, the kind of like frequency um, like bands that it has, like all of these things are def defining characteristics of the components that you know ahead of time and you can use them to assemble like complex pieces of equipment that have like very specialized functions. So instead of splitting up the UI like that, we're decomposing it into functional units that happen to be made up of multiple materials and multiple technology types allows us to uh, move away from that idea of uh, the, the initial imposed system that we, that we give engineers or that we give designers who wanna work on, uh, on delivering like applications is actually separated based on these functional units. <clears throat> and you know, an example of uh, you know, how that component might look would be something like this, where you have um, a photo and you don't really know about the details of what's going on inside there. You know, there could be all kinds of implementation details. Um, but all you know is that when you're the consumer of that photo, there's, that it, ha it has an interface, so it has some, has some options. It expects a photo to come in, you can tell it a size, and you can tell it a crop, and then you can put content within it. And this is like a much simpler uh, mechanism for building the UI, or for thinking about the UI and representing it, and having like a large team of people working on something that needs to undergo a lot of rapid change. When to use a photo, you just pick something up, drop it in and configure it, and you don't have to follow that chain of responsibility right down through to like the bare materials, the, the CSS and the JavaScript that, um, that helps to realize this, this unit. So you get this, um, like the freedom of simplicity through these higher level building blocks that people can rely on. Um, so at any point in time, if I'm building uh, a new widget, I don't have to know about the details of the, of the existing ones or other pieces that I'm gonna use to help realize what I've built. This also provides um, something that's quite important when you have like large teams as well, which is the idea of like functional segmentation that where there are particular owners over these, these units that other people are depending on. So when you have everything split up by technology type, um, working out like who owns what, who's responsible for these parts, um, how do I know what decisions to make around, you know, which, which bits of a component are free to be reused and not. Um, a lot of that can be, uh, can be solved for people by providing this functional segmentation that allows like ownership over particular units. Um, there's always someone to call, so when you have 100 engineers and you have to touch something for the first time, or you're a new engineer, there's somewhere in that directory, there's a, a file that tells you who to speak to. Uh, so there's some things that are missing from this, which is obviously you can't just go, oh, isn't it nice that there's like some healthcare professionals that have done all this scientific research. We'll just like take some concepts and you know justify what we're doing. Like the the important part is that they found was that using technology in and of itself, just like throwing it at a problem, uh, didn't solve the problem. That it also needed like sustained rollout, um, like support from uh, existing organizations, training people up to use them, uh, monitoring the consequences of the change that you've made. Because if you remember earlier on, I was saying how one of the characteristics of these systems is uh, emergent phenomena that you can't predict ahead of time and that small changes can result in large consequences, both good and bad. And so monitoring the consequences of your changes is really important to understand what subsequent changes need to be made in order to uh, keep the system within the bounds that you're looking for. So if it's starting to collapse, you wanna work out what you can do to pull it back. If it's starting to uh, solidify and become rigid, then you need to work out how to free things up again and to return some agency to the individuals that are involved. That's it, thank you.
Thanks a lot, Nicholas. Man, thought provoking. I love that. Um, so we don't have any time for questions right now. We're going to jump right into the next talk. Um, but hopefully Nicholas will be around if you guys want to find him, ask him some questions. Also, I'll plug the, the Facebook group again if you want to ask questions in there, keep the discussion going.